All right. Yeah. About me, my name is uh, Torben, and I'm Danish, and I've been programming since '85. Eight-bit home computers, first basic, then assembler. Then I learned about some object-oriented programming back in '96 at university. Java since 2000, and event sourcing since 2012. I was building event source systems with my colleagues at Bergen Kommune uh, back in 2012, 2013. And uh, but since since I moved to Oslo after that, I haven't really. Uh, built any anything event sourced uh, as a contractor you don't get to choose what you what you get to work with you just have to take the what you whatever you get but no matter where i was working i was always thinking about the business domain and how an event sourced infrastructure could benefit uh, the business if we go to that one yeah First, I'll talk a little bit about the basics in event sourcing. You have commands, you have events, projections, and sagas, which is for state. And a command might result in an event. A command is something that you instruct something to do, and it might result in an event. It might not. If we take the next slide. So a command is something someone or something asks to get done. So it has this imperative form here. Um, add credit card, for instance, create card, notify, relocation. And then you have events. That's something that's already has happened. So it is in past tense, credit card added, card created, relocation notified. It's something that has happened, and it's immutable by definition. And naming is very important here. Uh, it's very important that programmers use, I think, the same definitions as you know business users, that you talk the same language. It's something that's called uh, ubiquitous naming within a bounded context. You can uh, look more on this on domain-driven design and bounded contexts. Um, and also, the name should describe the intent behind the state change. So no, you should avoid these uh, CRUD names, you know, create, read, update, and delete in the naming. And an event, the details on it is that it always has a timestamp on it, and it has a source, and that's actually from where did the original command, uh, where did the command originate, either a user or a system. And then I want to talk a little bit about projections, which is, which is actually an in-memory table that's tailored to contain exactly the data that you need to visualize. Um, you can, you can. Imagine it being a, a relational table that you, where you create it on the fly, right? You you say exactly these values need we need to present, and then just build it from the event stream. And since developers can create, modify, or destroy these projections, there is no huge complex data model to understand, like in normal relational uh, databases where you expand and expand, you, you get this huge complex data model. So you have a relatively mild learning curve for new developers. All right. Next. Storage. Well, again, it's, it's a relatively simple thing. You have your events. You have your projection snapshots here. And uh, if you have a new uh, requirement, you write some code and you subscribe only to the, to the types of events that you're actually interested in and leave, leave the rest be. So you don't have to understand everything in order just to make one small thing. Um, yeah. And that's actually the basics 
there is another benefit that, if you go back again, <laughs> one benefit here is actually also when you're programming, uh, debugging can be a bitch. If you want to recreate, uh, a user had a bug at this and this point in time, in normal systems, it can be a bitch to recreate, but here you can go exactly in and recreate the system up until here. Boing. This is where the error occurred. You can recreate the exact state at the time of the error. Yeah. And that's actually the end of the basics because uh, there's a bunch of brilliant and very inspiring videos by Greg Young out there on the internet. And I would very much recommend you watch one of those if you want to learn more about the basics of event sourcing. Goody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Anyways, these basics, it's much better. There are much better and more inspiring videos on the internet by Greg Young. So, uh, but what, what really is the purpose of this talk is talking about the types of applications that are suddenly possible through event sourcing. And uh, that's very exciting. Let's go to the next one. Yeah. In Bergen and Comuna, we used event sourcing in one system to track accountability. For instance, when a case worker filled in some forms in a, uh, filled some fields in a form, where you could track exactly who, who filled in what and at what time. So you can have this, you, you by default get this uh, history log of who did what when. And that is very good for, for counting tracking accountability. In another system, we had this uh, form submission thing where, uh, <clears throat> where when you submit, you submit a form as a user in the commune, and then you can, we had this uh, back office program where you could track the progress of each form instance. What was the, uh, in, in each, uh, there was, server-side processing steps, what had happened at each step, was it successful, and so on, and you could see if it had been completely processed. But I will go to a telecom example, because I've worked in Teleto for the last two years. So, yeah. I have some example events here, events from one user. Subscription activated, <clears throat> top up data pack is purchased, customer support contacted, and web shop visited. And always you have this um, right as, as they're shown in this graph, you they don't have much of a delta between them, but I'm just putting this here, the time delta, in order to see that this is variable, right? So, when you combine event sourcing with business intelligence and reactive components, you can make something really interesting. Because if you take a bird's eye view of all these events, patterns start to emerge. And what you actually want, what, what is the purpose of this is to do pattern recognition and reacting to these patterns of events. But uh, this thing with uh, spotting patterns and trends, this is classic business intelligence, where you look at historic data and you, you know, find out what, what kind of, you, you analyze your way through to where you might be able to optimize the business. Um, but this, this I think, is only the first step. I think that being, being able to react quickly to these uh, patterns or trends that you spot, that's actually what gives competitive advantage. Because you, you, if, you, if you see some trend and then, okay, now we have to start programming some system that can respond to this, and then you can respond to it in three months, that's not so good. Yes. <clears throat> Goody, campaign editor. Dang. <laughs> All right. Um, 
here I have set up a GUI with criteria, criteria and actions. And criteria is actually just, this is a pattern recognition. And I see myself as, uh, I see a, I could see a business user using this, you know, to tweak these parameters, simulate, you can simulate this at any given historic time last week, last month, or fourth quarter last year, and see what would, it, what, what would have been the result, how many customers would have met all these criteria, and what would, what would the action have been if this campaign had been active in this historic interval. But okay, let's, uh, and also, I think also that uh, business logic isn't something that uh, should be programmed. I think it should be drag and drop configured by business users, but that's just me. I don't know. And uh, yeah, let's let's go through the GUI here. <clears throat> First criteria here is person has shown interest in a product. You select the product, the Samsung Galaxy S7. Yes, the presentation is very new. <laughs> <laughs> on the web shop within the last 60 hours. This also means that uh, the web shop registers these events or an LQB store within the last five days. This actually also means that every salesman out in any LQB store or whichever store has a sales system where he can register that a customer has expressed interest in this specific phone model. And then uh, the second criteria is customer with subscription, small or medium. Third criteria has purchased top-up data packages in excess of 1.4 gigabytes within the last 23 days. And the final criteria is binding runs out within 47 days. And all of this, all of these uh, variable values is just to show that this is something that I could imagine a user tweaking, you know, to optimize the campaign uh, as much as possible. Because if you collect all this, you see that, okay, the person has to have a relatively small subscription. He has to have been buying a lot of top-up data packages, and he's interested in this phone model, and his binding runs out. So all this does that it might be very uh, interesting for him to upgrade his subscription to a large one, including that product. Uh, if we see the actions, if person has not received a promotion of evening within the last 14 days in order to prevent spamming, <laughs> uh, send the LK promotion of this and you have a customer service action. If this person calls customer service within five days of criteria fulfillment, all these, then let customer service employee inform person about this LJ promotion again. And then you have the, the simulation area down here where you have the from and to dates. Again, you know, for simulating and stuff. And it doesn't take much imagination to see that you could actually have hundreds of these reactive components active at any given point in time, right? Because uh, you can have a, a business process where you develop this and you have a peer review, and then you just enable it in production by the push of a button, and then that campaign is running. Yeah. And this is an example of a, an external campaign. Uh, another example could be an internal campaign, you know, where if number of customer support contacted events within 72 hours of top up data package purchased exceeds so and so much, then generate a warning to the configuration team. Maybe this top up data package has been wrongly configured because it has so many that calls in. And, well, finally, 
this this is uh, nice for us programmers, but there might be some legal issues in tracking uh, user data like this. I don't uh, talk talk to your lawyer first. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And that's actually it. I think uh, event sourcing should be adopted as soon as possible because it uh, provides company with a colossal amount of business value and competitive advantage. And I hope uh, I hope I have somehow demonstrated this a little bit with this campaign editor I'm thinking about. I mean, and then the development of these smart apps in close collaboration with the business. Uh, you can create the best IT system in the world, but if those who are going to use it aren't comfortable with it, if they don't feel like they've been part in creating it, then it's just a waste of time. And uh, yeah, then there is something in the future where, I mean, maybe you've heard of these narrow AIs I mean, it's the more historic data. I mean, the, the earlier you adopt event sourcing, the more historic data you will have, and then the more you will be able to be able to teach. And the uh, the more historic data, the smarter the AI, because it'll be more precise in predicting the outcome of various situations. So, um, yeah, that's about it. So we can stop recording now. <laughs>